Two friends taking pictures of the rising full moon on a summer night. Two teenage kids doing what teenage kids do. When a stranger with a gun and a death wish changed everything. It was violent, it was senseless, and I will never understand it, I will never accept it. I'm Amy Donaldson, and unfortunately, we're all too familiar with stories about how violence shatters lives. But what we rarely see is how they are rebuilt. In a new podcast, The Letter, we relive tragedy, but only so we can hear the rest of the story. The struggle to reclaim lives, the realities of grief, and the possibilities of forgiveness. I believe in miracles. Sometimes I thought, there are no miracles. Yeah, there are, and this is a big one. Follow The Letter at theletterpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. But more importantly, it's a podcast about recovery. And my recovery began with Pinnacle Recovery Center. If you know somebody who needs some help, have them do what I did. Dr. Matt, you walked in. Yeah. And I said, how are you doing? And you said, <laughs> B+. Plus. B+. Plus. And I wanted yeah. to give you some guff, if I can use an old uh, person's term. All right. I wanted to give you some guff and go, B+, plus, man. I don't want B+. Plus. I want an A. What does a B plus look like to you? That's a pretty good day. That's a pretty good day. What do you think your average day is on a grade? I, I would say most most of my days are B plus A minus. And, and I yeah. think those are attainable goals. And the reason I ask is because I think <laughs> I think comparison. I was never a straight A student either. And neither so, was I. Know, right. So. And my mom offered to give us five hundred bucks if we ever got straight A's. What? Yeah. My, my dad offered not to kill me if I passed all my classes. Two different parenting right. tiles. Yeah. yeah, yeah, We're yeah. not judging. Yeah, we're not judging. Uh, I think... I think I prefer your mom's. <laughs> I think, yeah. Uh, so the reason I ask is I think comparison is the is killing joy. And it is, it is oh, yeah. it, you know, I, I think so many people do that. And especially when I'm out in the recovery world and people, they want what I have. And, and, and I want them to mm-hmm. want what I have, but to, at what cost? Well, you you mean getting caught up in a comparison? Yeah, right. The, here's something I tell people all the time, probably every day, literally, when we talk about this subject. There is always going to be someone who's bigger, faster, smarter, taller, whatever, er, mm-hmm. than you. So if you get caught up in comparing, you're always going to be able to find a way to put yourself down instead of. Focusing on where you're at and where you've been and where you're going, like it, it, it it's not, it's not a co- competition with other people. It, it really is. It should be more of a, a competition with yourself. Am I doing something to improve from where I've been in any area of my life? If so, I can feel good about that. It's part of. It's the process. It's not the outcome. If yeah. that makes sense. You know, because I just I, I put a, a picture of my family up on Instagram, and I wrote this. I like those pictures. Yeah, those they, were those were really nice. And, and I had a flood of emotions looking at these pictures because a year and a half ago, that wasn't what was going on in my life right, right. there. So me kissing my daughter and my arms around my oldest girl and my son laughing. I mean, those meant the world to me. And in the in the post, I said, "We will win, and we will lose." And, and and it was hard for me to write, we will lose, because the fighter in me doesn't want to admit right. that we do lose. Yeah. And, you know, learning to lose is an important lesson because we can't always win. It's, it, 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 right. it, it's just not possible. Well, that's where you gain progress is by evaluating your setbacks. If you lose or you have a setback, if you if you set a goal and you don't achieve it, by evaluating what happened, that's how you grow and progress so that you do better the next time. But it's so easy to get discouraged and get stalled out, especially in people's process of recovery. You know, you have such high hopes. You and I have both known plenty of people that have uh, stayed uh, clean and sober for long periods of time and then had a setback. But some of those people quickly rebound because they learn from those setbacks. Other people, that can be a, a side tour down a long and ugly path before they get back on track. Raise your hand if you're ready for a recovery meme. A recovery meme? I am. It's time to turn your losses into lessons. Oh, nice. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, it's a picture of a cat holding on to a... Something. No, I don't know. But, 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 you know, it's one of those sayings that I hear, and then the more I think about it, and I go, 
There's a lot of wisdom in that. Yeah. You know, really, yeah. it, it, it's not what happens when you get knocked down because sh- secret time, everybody gets knocked down. Right. It's what you do afterwards. It's the, at my house, we call it the Batman principle. Ooh, I want to hear right? more. So, so Batman begins, you know, you know, little uh, Bruce Wayne falls down and breaks his arm and his dad says, why do we fall down so we can learn to get back up again? Oh. Right. So kind of same idea. Do it in a Batman voice. <laughs> you don't have to. I, I, I don't hey, think so I can welcome do it. to the podcast today. We've got a, another amazing guest, and I'm so thankful for all these people reaching out to me and wanting to share their story. Because once again, I think the more we share stories, oh, it's been great. The more we can learn. Yeah, we're learning. I think you and I are both learning a lot from the people that are listening and willing to come on and share their story. So I met this man, Ryan. How are you, buddy? I am great, man. Great, great to be here, man. I'm so grateful. All right, so Ryan, let's uh, let's let's start out with uh, who you are and where you're from. All right. Um. So I'm 35, and I was born in Salt Lake, and most of my life I spent moving around. Um, three years old, I went to California. Then I went to London at nine. Uh, Boston till I was 13, back to Salt Lake, and then and then high school and college here, but just kind of all around. And so when uh, when did life get uh, a little crazy for you? Oh, man. I, I would say, you know, it started um, with kind of getting depressed with moving. Um, you know, at 10 years old, getting up uprooted and moving to a different country. What was the cause of all those moves? Um, those was, are, that's all over the place. That's yeah, and typically people are like, oh, you must be a military brat. And um, uh, my dad was just taking different uh, different challenges in his career as an executive for medical device companies. Okay. Um, so it was your dad's work, basically. Exactly. Right? Exactly. But I think, you know, on the outside, you know, Boston, London, I mean, those are, that'd be cool to be able to say you lived in all those places. You know, it, I think that's how you have to reframe it as an adult. And Ryan, you can talk about how you really feel about it. But I'll tell you, I talk to a lot of kids and that's not cool when you're a kid. When you're a kid, you just want to have your crew, your your buddies that you hang out with. You want to have your your yard and your baseball team and all that kind of stuff. That's and your world. Moving yeah. around to the, even though I mean you were moving to some pretty cool places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that that only seems cool when you're older. Is that right? Yeah, you know, it's, I appreciated it as much as I could as a you know ten eleven to get to travel. Um, we got to go all around Europe, and it is it's it's great to say. Um, but the reality was I was in different schools every six months, mm. um, private, public, private, public. Uh, and it, it just, it, it ate at me. I was a very social kid. I played all the sports. I really, really wanted some sort of stability and home, just a hometown feel. Um, I get really jealous just like comparing uh, with people around here like, oh, I've known this guy for 20 years and we went to school together. And you know, I don't have I don't have that. I don't have roots or ties like that. Most of the people I was friends with were in a similar position because uh, I went to schools that were structured for that. International school. Yes, or something. exactly. And um, so probably about a year into, into living in London, um, the newness wore off. Um, the cool factor was gone. The new country smell. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, I have that air freshener. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was, it just, it started so to get really 10. bad. You were yeah. only 10 at that time. Yeah, and I was from San Diego, man. Like, I was used to 72 degrees. Uh, it was beautiful, the waves and, and the ocean. We were, it was, it was picture perfect. And then, and then plopped down into clouds and gloom and rain. And I don't know anybody. Uh, had to drink tea every day. Uh, the tea's wearing uh, your Doc way better Martins. than coffee. It's yeah. way better than coffee. <laughs> so, did, is that when you first started experimenting with what were you into? Alcohol, drugs? Uh, that first time I, when I was in London, um, I I tried pot. I tried to smoke weed at ten years old. At ten, and I I say luckily now I, I was allergic. Um, I got violently sick. wasn't for me. That's a thing. I, I know. I it's get pretty that. uncommon, but yeah. Yeah, it was it was terrible, and I'm really grateful for that now because I could have seen myself headed down a path what, earlier. What were those symptoms for uh, for the listeners? Um, you know, I think we we all can kind of relate to adult depression a little bit more easily. What's a ten year old's depression like? Oh man, it was home, like this this hopelessness, just this feeling of I have no control in this situation. Right, my input didn't matter. I mean, I'm sure it mattered, but I mean, in, in all Dad's reality, work and, right. right? You yeah. know, we have to have an income, and I'm 
grateful that my father worked as hard and provided that the way that he did. And but at, at ten, I I would sit in my room. I remember uh, Alanis Morissette was uh, my jam. Okay, there's, you your, know. there's your first problem yep. right there. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's depressing. Alanis <laughs> Morissette spoke to a generation. Uh, yeah, a depressed generation. Yes, <laughs> it's like sure. a free ride when you've <laughs> already <90s>. paid. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, I paid. I paid for it for sure. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's just what it felt like. I just remember sitting in my room. Um, from from a jovial, outgoing kid to, to just going through the motions. And, and that's a real thing. I mean, you mentioned the, the climate change from San Diego to London, and a lot of people don't realize that, but, but here in Salt Lake, we have that sort of throughout the years. Salt Lake is such a, a bright, sunny, warm place half the year, and then about, you know, September, October, it starts to get darker and colder, and, you know, we get the inversion setting in, so... A lot of people listening to this can probably relate to how much the weather affects people. Yeah, and it's I always find I always people try to dismiss it, you know, like oh it's it's just the weather, it's it's just winter. But you know, I, I have a lot of people I've met that you know, the, I think it's seasonal affective disorder. Correct, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, but it was it was rough, and and so after I I tried marijuana, I was gone again, so we moved to Boston. And another sunny city, yeah, and just lovely people, <laughs> yeah, um, real super warm. nice, yeah, yeah, welcoming. And um, that was uh, alcohol. I found um, a bottle of wine, uh, just grabbed one off the collection. I had good taste apparently because it was yeah. a very expensive bottle of wine. I found out <laughs> later. Um, but yeah, we, uh, me and my neighbor, we just we drank the whole bottle of wine in probably two minutes it was really disgusting at the time and we just tore up his house and yeah we got we got caught almost immediately yeah um and the culture of my family when it comes to alcohol is um it was pretty loose um like i come from a very staunch catholic side for my father and my mother was uh, a non-practicing LDS, and so they grew up with just alcohol around the house. It was it was fine. It was normal. Um, so I wasn't. I was like grounded. I think um, for like a day. You know, don't do it again. Um, and and honestly, it wasn't my thing either. Um, I, I tried pot and I got drunk maybe twice more in Boston before we moved again. Uh, but nothing that nothing that really grabbed at me yet. Um, but I was nothing that answered any questions. For nothing you. yet. No. Why do you think at such a young age you were going for those things, going for the marijuana, going for the alcohol? Was it to compensate for those feelings of depression? I th- was it to fit in? No, to find new it, friends. It, well, yeah, yeah, because you know when you if you want to have real relationships, it takes work, right? You gotta you have to be reciprocal. You have to talk to people. You have to invest time. Well, if you go for the the bad group of kids, they don't care. You know, there's it's instant relationship if you're drinking or getting high with them, and especially if you're providing it. You, yeah, it makes you popular. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in, yeah, in, in the way that I wanted at that moment. And um, so, kind of a quick fix, basically. Yeah, exactly, it's but, a quick social fix, and being accepted quickly was kind of an attempt at making yourself feel a little bit better, perhaps. Yeah, which is really important at that pre-early adolescent age. And the, you know, I, I want to mention this too because I hear it every now and again in the rooms about always feeling different. Um, just you know, not just like I didn't belong. Um, it wasn't a real intense feeling, but I just always felt out of place. Well, you said earlier that you didn't have any roots anywhere. Yeah, and, and maybe it stems from that. I, I imagine it does. Um, but I just always, like you said, look. I was looking for something, anything. But at this point, you said alcohol wasn't your thing, marijuana wasn't your thing. What eventually became your thing? And when I was uh, rooted back here for junior high school... Um, I, I got on the baseball team. It looked like we were going to be here for a while. So I, I reinvested some time, um, and I got injured right away. And uh, I became the poster boy for the opioid crisis. Um, multiple surgeries. And I remember the first time I was driving to school. I was just barely 16. I uh, just had surgery, and I was having really bad pain. I was like, I'll just take one extra. Uh, and... I can't explain that feeling other than like 
I realized I was home. I, this is it. This is what I've been missing. This is what everybody else feels like all the time. Now I can function. Kind of like uh, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. You felt completed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It was. Yeah, I can't even explain it. I don't. It was just yes. Like this is this is it. I'm fine now. I'm okay. Things will be okay. And things were not okay. Um, it just became surgeries. Um, unbeknownst to me, it was probably you know uh, driven by my addiction. Uh, but I, I did have a lot of injuries, lots of surgeries, and it was fairly consistent. And I don't think I went a day without uh, pain meds from 15 till 18. Thir three years. Mm -hmm. And these were sports injury-related surgeries? Correct. So. Baseball. Yeah, big baseball guy. Uh -huh. And just uh, tore my rotator cuff and other ones and then my knee. Just lots of things that went wrong. Uh, and it was... It, but it was okay. I felt okay, and uh, it it didn't feel like a problem. I, you know, this this wasn't on the news everywhere. You know, nobody really knew about it, and they were happy to prescribe whatever. So, but in the three years that you were using them, you said fifteen to eighteen. Uh, there wasn't a day that probably went by that you didn't have pain pills in your system. Correct. Were you abusing the prescription, or were you just in constant supply of them? No, I was I was definitely abusing them for sure. Um, but probably maybe in a atypical sense, I would save like my days worth, right, and then take them all at once so that I got that intense high, the euphoria. Mm -hmm. um, but if I ran out early, which was often, I could just call, and it was no problem. They like you weren't going to the streets or trying to get them from uh, other places. Not yet. No, yeah, no, just um, I mean, I, this would have been the 1990s, yep, probably yeah, yeah. late late 90s, like 98, 99, uh -huh. and that was a time when I don't think the 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 education in the public and in and to a large degree even in the medical field was there to try to you know rein in the prescriptions, like you said, that one of the big problems, the reason we've ended up in the opioid crisis, is because it was so readily available, you know. Doctor's offices didn't want to deny people prescriptions if they said they ran out and they were in pain. And, mm -hmm. and medicine, you know, the medical field's goal is to Help. reduce pain and be helpful. So, you know, it, it was just this whole culture. It was a new frontier. Yeah, that was built up around, you know, pain medicine. It's the story of an American held in a dark Venezuelan prison. Then all of a sudden, they all kind of lined up. They pointed their guns at me. And this is the point where I thought, I'm going to die today. I'm Becky Bruce. I spent a year working on Hope in Darkness, which now has more than 2 million downloads. Find it on kslpodcast.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. So for three years, uh, abusing pain pills, at any point in long, in, along that road, did anybody go, hey, you might want to think about this? No. Nope, not at all. Um, I was full on. And the thing, I, I was, uh, I loved school. I, uh, I performed excellent. and Grades were good. Oh, yeah. Uh, nearly straight A's, academic scholarship to Westminster. Um, so... There wasn't any outward signs. I was responsible and got good grades. I had a job. And people weren't asking those questions um, until, I think, somewhere in there, like 16, 17, it was the first time I tried illicit drugs. And uh, I went right to ecstasy because I, I knew marijuana didn't do it for me. Um, and that was a big leap for me. I, you know, I was brought up, don't do drugs, it's bad. And, and I believed all that. And, the uh, whole time you're throwing pain pills in your mouth. Let's, well, those aren't drugs, right? Because yeah. that doctor gave those to me. There you go. That was going to be my question was, what was your own self-evaluation during that time? First of all, you're an adolescent. So, you know, when we're adolescents, our judgment is <laughs> iffy at best. We're learning to, to exercise good judgment during those years. And uh, did you see a correlation between taking these prescribed pills and smoking weed as you know, these are similar, or did you feel 
more comfortable taking the pills because they'd been prescribed. I was, yeah, I I was already rationalizing and judging other people for doing illegal drugs. I I was one of the people I looked down on people. I was like, wow, that's that's really He's a sad. pothead. Yep, pothead, you know. junkie, yeah. all of that. I'm. But look at me, you know, I have a job and I'm in control. So Getting no, good I, grades. Yeah, why Why would I question yeah. anything at that point? And I think that's another one of those psychological factors culturally that we've had to overcome in the last 10 years as we've realized there is a crisis with opioids is the whole psychological evaluation of this is a prescribed medicine by my doctor. Mm-hmm. And, and that really messes with your ability to distinguish between you know, uh, the danger and non-danger of this versus a street drug. It has to be safe, right? Because they got it from a doctor and a pharmacy and they've tested it. I mean, those are the things I was thinking. Right. Um, And and ecstasy was my leap. And it was hard. I remember being really hesitant, like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do drugs. And and ecstasy was just like the gateway. That was my like, wow, why is everybody think drugs are bad? This is amazing. And, but immediately the next day that come down, I realized this is why this is a problem. Mm. Cause um, you wanted to get that euphoria back. Absolutely. Right away. And, um, I was scared, but I, I, I had started there. So I continued on with the pain pills cause I just looked at that, like, you know, my, my daily routine. Um, and we started my group of friends and I just started doing ecstasy on the weekends uh, but it was it was becoming an issue with um, people started asking questions at that point. Um, why were you late? Why do you look funny? Um, but I still wasn't. I never had any real consequences negative that would have you know motivated me to change until. So you were in high school and you were doing ecstasy. Yes. Yes. So then when you you you, you graduate high school, where mm-hmm. do you go from there? Uh, I, uh, somewhere between final exams and graduation, uh, it all kind of came to a head. I ran out of prescriptions and I got very sick. Like, obviously, it seems obvious now. I didn't know what was wrong. Dope sick. Yep. That was my first dope sick. I thought I had the flu. And um, then I had found a pill or something that I'd lost, took it real. And I was like, oh, I got it now. Like this is from this, and this is this is very bad. And I I asked for help, and I actually went to rehab and graduated high school. I got my like I didn't walk with my class. I walked with my rehab class instead. So I uh, immediately did you do like a thirty day treatment center or I did. I didn't make it the full thirty days. No. Um, Unfortunately, I'm a, I was a very slow learner in recovery. Um, I still couldn't get over the justification that it comes from a doctor. Um, I was just out of control. I can do this now. I need it. I'm in pain. All of the, all of the things. And uh, I, I uh, was asked to leave about two weeks in and still completely oblivious that, that uh, you know, when you're an addict, at least for me, that means all all drugs. Like I couldn't drink, I, but this whole time I just okay. I'll just drink. I didn't like it that much, but it was something. And it started slowly in my head realizing I'm I'm seeking something again. I'm unhappy. Um, in high school, I uh, I was uh, uh, borderline diagnosed border, borderline. I was a self mutilator. Borderline personality mm-hmm. disorder. Yeah. And so. Um, I was. Uh, How old were you when the self harming started? Self harming started at about fourteen, and continued uh, at least at least through my junior year of college, um, and that that was a really hard thing, and that's really shameful. Even still, I have these scars that I get a lot of questions about. Well, I mean, I, so much in fact that your mannerism changed when you, when you, and I see you struggled to come out and admit that. Why, why was that? Uh, you know, the, the people uh, that, that don't understand um, depression and especially self-harm, um, it's, it's a, 
it's a whole different beast. And just statistically, what I know, um, males are very rarely self mutilators as far in proportion to women. It's about four to one. Yeah. And so knowing I was already um, having pill problems and now I have uh, scars on my arms, um, I remember my friends asking me, you know, you know, what is wrong with you? Is man up. Like, um, and it wasn't until um, I got kicked out of rehab that uh, something from when I was little kind of popped up and uh, I was I was sexually abused. Uh, sorry. No, you're okay. Take some time. I know this is this is tough. Um, when I was about seven, and um, I think I, I always put on like a, a pretty good front for my family, and that the drugs are what made it okay. Uh, but it was. <clears throat> On top of it, it felt like I was um, really, really judged by my friends. I, they didn't know. Nobody knew. I didn't tell anybody about that until I was uh, about four or five years ago. Just um, and so I, I just, I just felt um, like I, I wasn't good enough. I was like something to be used for one, um, and that I was supposed to just quote be a man um and i couldn't i couldn't do it well you talked earlier about feeling um different always feeling different and uh um you know moving around a lot as a kid can have that effect to some degree but i would assume that you know the feeling of the feelings that result of about one's self-esteem after having been abused but especially sexually abused that's a very common uh, statement that a person will make is, you know, I was abused, sexually abused as a child. And after that, I never really kind of felt normal. I always felt different or weird or out of place. And, and I think, you know, uh, what you also said, a lot of people would relate to who have been abused is i I felt kind of worthless. Like it was okay for me to continue to be treated poorly. And so, um, I'm, I'm sure that, that that was underlying a lot of the... the and, and self-harming happens in different ways. There's self-harming through cutting. Sure. But, you know, doing things like pounding a bunch of alcohol when you're a kid or, you know, seeking drugs. These, these are also kind of out-of-control, dangerous, self-harming type behaviors in a way. And, and uh, you know, I appreciate you being authentic and raw and, and sharing that with our audience. Um, there are a lot of people who are in your same boat that they may be listening right now and haven't told anyone yet. And they are our age, you know, they're in their thirties or forties and keeping that to themselves. Um, you waited till you were about 30 to tell anyone. Why was that? Uh, shame. I mean, that's it. I feel like the, uh, mentality of our society is if you're a man or even a boy, uh, you should be able to handle yourself. Yeah, people say man up, be tough, mm -hmm. sack up, that Walk kind it of off. stuff. Yeah, right? rub some dirt on it. Yeah, and uh, Stupid advice. Oh, it's horrible advice. It it's, it's really comes from a place of, I think, inadequacy when an adult tells a kid something like that. And the kids we believe, as kids, we believe what our adults tell us. And yeah. an adult's inadequate if they don't know how to actually help somebody who's struggling. So they say things like, I'll give you something up. to cry about. You want to mm -hmm. cry? Right, yeah. right. And Hate that stuff. Yeah, that's damaging. And, it, you know, I, when I, I waited till I was 30 to, to ever talk about it. Um, and I, I'm working in this, in the recovery field now. I've had a lot of the of the clients who will tell me as a guy but just one on one you know um hey man that you know that happened to me and that like that's the end of it um it's i i just want uh other guys to to realize like you got, i mean it wasn't your fault yeah i mean it's 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 even more than that like 
obviously that person is sick and it wasn't about me. It was about them. And I, it took a long time to even realize and say these things. And I think I mostly believe it now um, that I, you know, that I, as a kid and all the things that we hear, you know, you, you blame yourself. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Kids are what we call egocentric. And that doesn't mean egotistical. What that means is kids, the way their cognitive brains develop is you start from a, I'm the center of the world perspective. And as you grow and your ability to take other people's points of view increases, then you start to be other oriented, but you're self oriented or egocentric as a child. So one of the biggest damaging factors of abuse in children is that they blame themselves. It may have been dad who hit them or an uncle who molested them. Uh, somebody else mistreated them. But most kids harbor a real belief that somehow they're to blame. And it sounds if like... If I could have been better, if I could have been smarter, right. if I had done this, this wouldn't have happened to me. It so happened many, to me because I wasn't any of those things. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I've talked to so many people who as as uh, older teens or young adults are still holding on to the idea that they should have been able to fight this adult off or be stronger, or be smarter, or anticipate it. And of course, a child can't do any of those things. But because of that worldview that I'm, you know, myself first, then you harbor that. And that that's more damaging uh, over time than whatever actual physical damage happened to the child. This information came out uh, through your recovery process, mm -hmm. but I don't want to get to that just yet because you talked about walking through graduation with people in your rehab. Yeah. You weren't there, but you ended up going to one of the most prestigious colleges here in Utah. You went to Westminster. I did, and um, I, I was still right back. I got right back on the pills to function, but for the first uh, two years, I... Uh, I did well outwardly. Uh, it looked I looked good on paper, um, but I started going downhill uh, with selling cocaine at that point. And it wasn't for money. It was it was that seeking out validation relationships again. Power, purpose. Yep. Uh, yeah, they needed me. I felt important, and um, I eventually did get uh, caught by the school, uh, and I was reprimanded. I was. Uh, I lost my ability to live in the dorms, and uh, after that, without, I, w I was in no position to provide my own housing and, and stuff like that, so it was really quickly that I got... So without the structure of the university and the dorm life, you were kind right. of left to your own, and uh, that wasn't a good recipe. Oh, no, no. Downhill very fast. Um, Where were your parents and your family uh, on the along this process? Uh, so they were still living in San Diego at this point. Well, yeah, they moved back when I graduated high school, and um, yeah, I came to college and it just went downhill. But I was, I'm, you know, I'm very close with my with my family, um, and I just did. I think a lot of the college students just, you know, hey, mom, dad, everything's cool. Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm not, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to disappoint. And um, but it, it all comes out, and I, you know, I got kicked out of the dorms uh, very quickly. Deteriorated into uh, losing my grades, then my scholarship went, uh, and then eventually I just I didn't care. I was by that point uh, I was doctor shopping, um, snorting pills, buying them on the streets. That's when I started getting into the more illegal side of of drugs, and it. It just it got bad really really fast, and I lost I lost my house and my parents. You know, they did everything they thought to do was right, which was rescue me, and so they would always rescue me. Oh, we'll get you a new house. We'll get you we'll get you set up, and every time I would fail, ruin it because I was a I was that's what you did. That's that's what I do, um, and that that was just a repeated thing in my life. I could maybe get clean for a month or two and i just i couldn't handle the emotions i could i don't i could not be in my own skin so on this show we talk about someone's rock bottom what does your rock bottom look like oh man uh not far after that i uh, got introduced to heroin and that took me to my rock bottom in record time 
Uh, it looks like jail. Um, I've I did some time and was charged with two felony assaults um, in St. George, and I just left. I wasn't ready yet. Moved to Salt Lake. Didn't do anything on my probation and homelessness was was real then my family had wise and you know smartened up listened to the to the professionals advising them you got to let him go on his own and that's tough as a parent to say it's the right advice um but that doesn't make it I don't easier know, i don't know how i would be able to handle that as a father to be honest i've thought about that before you know what will i ever be in that position i know what the advice is professionally mm-hmm. the rescuing you're the create, guy who gives create, the advice yeah. mm-hmm. that rescuing cycle that so many parents do just uh, you know helps a person practice their addiction longer and uh it isn't healthy for them but i i can only imagine how difficult that was for your parents. How difficult was it for you to have them stop supporting you that way? I that that was it for me. That was how my rock bottom came. Is because at that time I felt like they're turning their back on me. Right. They've given up. So you were close with your family. Yeah, you felt they loved you. Yeah. of this program are for informational purposes only. The program is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician, licensed therapist, or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you've heard on this program. KSL does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, physicians, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned on the program. Reliance on any information provided on the program is solely at your own risk.